today's reading is from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Please feel free to read along by turning to page 3 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bibles. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The, temper, the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command those stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, one does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. <coughs> Then the devil left him, and suddenly the angels came and waited on him. May the spirit of wisdom guide our understanding of this scripture. Thank you, God. This is one of those Sundays when the uh, when the sermon sort of migrated a little bit from the time I had to give the title to the time I finished it. <laughs> so you can sort of disregard the sermon title of your order of worship. One of these days. Let's pray. Loving God, it is our prayer just now that the words of my mouth and the meditations, especially the meditations of our hearts, would be acceptable to you. For you remain our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For the first four days of our recent trip to the Holy Land, we were embedded in the town of Bethlehem, in what is commonly known now as the West Bank of Palestine. We used this central location for those days to visit various places around Jerusalem, the Old City, and then one day we went south down to Hebron, also in the West Bank, to visit the tombs of Sarah and her son Isaac. Abraham is buried elsewhere. While we were there in Bethlehem, right out of the window of our hotel, they opened the curtains, we could see Manger Square. Manger Square, where all the crowds gathered on Christmas Eve outside the Church of the Nativity, the supposed birth site of Jesus. How many times at 11.30 p.m. putting together toys on Christmas Eve did I see Manger Square on the television? Manger Square, we're across from that church, across an international peace plaza, sits a Bethlehem mosque that used to be a Byzantine Greek Orthodox church. A Bethlehem mosque with its occasional calls to prayer during the day that begin, I want you to know, at 6 a.m. right across from our hotel room. More on Bethlehem later. We spent four days there, but on the fifth day of our trip, we all packed up our stuff and we piled into the bus to take the trip from Bethlehem up north to Nazareth, which began with a trip from Bethlehem 
down in elevation to Jericho. A trip that follows the windy, steep Kidron Valley all the way down in our big old tour bus. Back and forth, hairpin turns all the way down to 625 feet below sea level. Nadia Bowles Weber, a Lutheran pastor of some renown, took that same trip a few years ago, and she describes it pretty accurately when she says, I'd gone on a week on a two-week-long trip to the Holy Land, hoping to see some of the places Jesus had been, but I didn't anticipate calling on him in prayer quite so much on a single bus ride near the place of his birth. There were enough hairpin turns to keep me alternately praying and cursing, praying and cursing, like a foul-mouthed monk. It was very steep, very windy in that big old bus. Someone else who took that trip a longer time ago on foot was the poor soul whom Jesus talked about in his parable of the Good Samaritan. You all may remember how that parable starts. A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves who stripped him and left him for dead along the side of the road. As our bus was winding its way along these very same roads, two things became very clear to me. First, if thieves and robbers were going to choose a place to jump an unsuspecting man and get away with it, this road down to Jericho was a very good choice. It is out there in the wilderness. And second, if said thieves and robbers were going to leave their victim on the side of the road, it wouldn't be as if the victim were laying out there, as I've often pictured him, on the shoulder of a superhighway, easy to spot. Take it from Nada, take it from me. The side of the road goes straight down. The road from Bethlehem or Jerusalem down to Jericho. It is desolate, it is windy, and it is very steep. Our bus stopped about five kilometers before we got to Jericho to drop off those of us who had signed up to take a hike for the rest of the way through the last part of that Kidron Valley all the way down to what may be the oldest city in the whole world, the city of Jericho, the heart of the cradle of civilization still so lush and green, an oasis. The photographs on the back of your order of worship were taken on that five kilometer hike through the last part of the Kidron Valley. The first and larger of the pictures is a photograph of the monastery of Saints John and George a monastery that dates all the way back to 420 of the Common Era, the Greek Orthodox monastery. Shortly after, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire and could do things like build monasteries on the side of mountains. The monastery was built on this particular site that you see there because it was believed to have been, and we learned that tour guide's favorite caveat is believed to have been the place where Elijah rested when he was being chased by Jezebel and may have even been the place where he stepped out of the cave after the earthquake had passed and the wind had passed to hear the still small voice of God. The valley you see beneath the monastery there is believed by some to be the valley that inspired King David to write the words, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Well, as we walk through that same valley, I'm not sure I was totally in sync with King David on the fearing no evil thing. 
It was a pretty narrow path at times. But we eventually made it around the monastery, which is still active, still two or three or four uh, Greek Orthodox monks that keep house there. And we made it to, to where the second photograph was taken from a site that has been maintained over the years, recent years, by an old solitary priest. He's maintaining it because many believe that this spot where there is a little cave underneath the path may have been one of the places where Joseph and Mary stayed overnight as they made their way up the Kidron Valley from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Or up the Kidron Valley from Nazareth to Jerusalem, where we are pretty sure Jesus was blessed or bar mitzvahed at the age of 12, and we had that whole getting lost in the temple fiasco. This valley is kind of like the crimped place in the hourglass, if you will, of Palestine. As you go back and forth between Upper Galilee, where Jesus grew up, and Jerusalem, where he was killed. The other thing I'd like to call your attention to about the second photograph is that there in the distance, where the narrow chasm opens up, is the city of Jericho, sitting in the middle of the valley of the Jordan River. It sits in the middle of this rich, lush Jordan Valley, and which is only a little ways away from the river, where the Hebrew people crossed into the Promised Land, and where so much of the story of the Hebrew people was written. So, what does all this scenery have to do with the temptation with Jesus? Well, I think Jesus sort of took the reverse trip to the one we took a few Wednesdays ago after he was baptized. The story we read in the Gospel that Cheryl read for us is that Jesus heard about John the Baptist from all the way up in Galilee, up in Nazareth. He came down several days' journey from Nazareth to the Jordan River to be baptized by the very popular John, and then was led up from the Jordan River and across that beautiful, lush river valley, and then up into the mountains, much like the ones you see in the back of the Order of Worship. When we visited the Jordan River, there were crowds of people, just like were there, I imagine, when Jesus was baptized. <clears throat> of course, our crowds of people all arrived on buses that sat out on big asphalt parking lots, idling away while the bus drivers, who had just successfully gotten us through that ravine, sat smoking cigarettes. And our crowds included Israeli troops standing on the banks of the River Jordan to keep the peace as people were getting baptized. Maybe, maybe there were Roman troops when Jesus was being baptized, keeping the peace. But I don't think those troops were doing what the Israeli troops were doing, which was to pose for selfies with the ones who were choosing to be baptized that day. And baptism, just as an aside, doesn't happen by getting lowered and raised from the Jordan River, but there's a special little pipe that goes up, and there's a shower head that raises the Jordan River on top of your head. That's how you get baptized in the Jordan River now, if you want to do it. In case you want to know. Presumably, Jesus made his way through a different kind of crowd of people after he was baptized. And the text says that the Spirit led him up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. But in order to get into that wilderness, up those steep mountains, Jesus would have had to walk his way through that beautiful oasis, Jordan River Valley, so lush and green. But also the backdrop of so many of the stories that made Jesus who he was. The entry into the promised land. The battle of Jericho, Jacob meeting Esau and reconciling with each other, Elijah and Elisha, the chariot going up into heaven, King David, all of those stories. And then, then it was up into the wilderness he went. Do you hear that progression? 
from the river, from the waters of new life, through the stories that formed who he was, and then up into the wilderness was where Jesus went and where he was tested. Does that progression sound familiar to you? All of us also emerge from the waters of life. We walk through the stories that form us. Our stories of origin, our Jordan Valley stories, you know what they are. The stories that make us who we are. They make us Lutherans or Methodists or disciples. The stories that make us country girls or city boys or suburban kids who aren't sure which camp we belong in. The stories that make us engineers or teachers or carpenters. The stories that give us a love for animals or a heart for the underdog. The stories of our origin that often define who we think of as us and who we think of as them. The stories that give some of us siblings and others of us lifelong friends. The stories that help us learn how to adult in this world through the adults who surrounded us. Each of us has a Jordan Valley full of stories, don't we? Stories that make us who we are for better and for worse. Wow, think of that. Think about your Jordan Valley of stories, your stories of origin that are still so formative in who, who we are. And then, then, walk with Jesus up into the wilderness where those stories get tested by the severe realities of life. Our stories of origin may have had us going off to college like most of the other kids until we walked into that office as a Navy recruiter just on a whim or until the semester where we took wood shop in high school and fell in love with working with our hands. Our stories of origin might have had us getting married and having children until we discovered we really kind of like being alone, or until we discovered that our bodies could neither make or carry babies, and we were in the wilderness. That's the kind of thing that happens out in the wilderness. Like Jesus' story, our stories get tested in the wilderness. I grew up in a, in a time and place where the predominant story was mostly about doing well enough in high school to go to college, to get a job, to make enough money to be able to buy a house and live in the same kind of neighborhood where I grew up. Which meant that when I was faced with the question, do I really want to do with my life? Just that question threw me into the wilderness. I don't know, I never thought about that part. Lots of us grew up in places where there were certain assumptions about gender identity or sexual orientation. When questions arise about that, we find ourselves in the wilderness. <coughs> I guess the point is that most all of us go up from the Jordan Valley of our lives where everything is lush and green, up the hill, up the mountain, where everything gets tested. Sometimes the wilderness happens when we come of age. Sometimes it happens when we flunk out of chemistry and have to rethink that whole pre-med thing. Sometimes the wilderness happens when our marriage needs some work and we have to decide whether to put that work into it. Sometimes the wilderness happens when we get sick or when we lose someone special. Sometimes the wilderness happens when the kids really aren't okay. Sometimes the wilderness happens when we are forced to retire before we're really ready financially. The wilderness is real, isn't it? And it is that place where the tempter, the questioner lives. I don't know. I'm kind of thinking that through the years, the devil in this story, the tempter, has gotten a bad rap. In fact, I'm almost thinking that the devil in this story is almost as important as the spirit. The temptation of Jesus almost as important as the baptism of Jesus. All the devil is doing is asking the hard questions. 
that no one else is willing to ask. And maybe thinking about and coming to terms with those questions are what lead us out of the wilderness again and into a different new green lush valley. A valley of purpose. Maybe even a new story. The Jordan Valley is beautiful and lush, but the wilderness has a beauty all of its own, doesn't it? I mean, just look at it. Breathtaking, really. And I kind of wonder whether that wilderness, the home of the tempter, is the place where ultimately we find ourselves. So, people of God, this season of Lent is that season where we are invited to cross through the Jordan Valley, to take leave, perhaps for a while, from our community of support, to walk up into the wilderness where it's dangerous, where, where, where the hard but ultimately freeing questions get asked, and to take some comfort when we do that in knowing that Jesus did the very same thing.